Stephen Greer, why UFO disclosure taking so long and when will full disclosure happen? The disclosure movement is a research project working to fully disclose the facts about UFOs, extraterrestrial intelligence, and classified advanced energy and propulsion systems. We have over 500 government, military, and intelligence community witnesses testifying to their direct, personal, first-hand experience with UFOs, ETs, ET technology, and the cover-up that keeps this information secret. Dr. Stephen Greer has been on the forefront of this movement. During this presentation he explains why disclosure is such a difficult process with all the different actors involved government agencies, extraterrestrial influence, corporate money. The list goes on and on. Which levels of secrecy exist out there? What has been hide from public eyes? These are the question that we should ask ourselves in order to succeed in bringing out the truth. During this presentation Stephen Greer tell us many truths and explain us when disclosure will happen. We have to keep searching because the truth is out there. Well, as I mentioned, we've already done disclosure. The majority of people know this stuff is real. Um, I'm talking about the masses. If you take any poll, more people believe this stuff is real than have voted for any president in our lifetime. The question is whether there will be official disclosure. So let's, let's make two distinctions. Disclosure by what we're doing as a grassroots entity versus some authority figure up on Capitol Hill or at the 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue or at the UN doing it. The latter is unlikely. I already, I already sowed that a long time ago. Uh, we had tens of thousands of people uh, faxing and writing to their members of Congress after the initial disclosure project, because I was the father of the whole global disclosure movement. Um, and then, of course, 9-11 happened, <laughs> which moved it off everyone's radar screen. My own sense is that the best way we're going to have more disclosure is to have thousands of people doing and making open contact, where it becomes something you cannot stop. The intelligence community cannot put that genie back in the bottle. And secondly, more people coming forward who are whistleblowers or insiders with documents and evidence. The likelihood that any committee of the Congress or anyone at the White House will do this uh, is, I think, very, very low. I don't care how many people write them. Uh, I'm not saying that we shouldn't encourage them, it's their responsibility, but I'm just saying I've already done that over the last 20 years very, very thoroughly. Um, and a lot of people involved with disclosure now actually have never had sit-down meetings with current members of administrations in Congress. I have. And what you hear from them is that, yes, this is wonderful, but let someone else do it. I'll never forget meeting with a senator, uh, Senator Dick Bryan, who was from Nevada, whose home state has Nellis Air Force Base in Area 51, as the public calls it. Um, uh, Pahoot Mesa, S4, S9, S12, all the top secret underground facilities. And he and I met at McCarran Airport in a, what looked like a janitor's closet, and it was just a broom, and you're taken there in a cart, and the door opens, and it's this gorgeous conference room for VIPs. This is how things are done, by the way. And uh, things really happen this way. Uh, although it would make a great movie. Uh, and uh, so we go in there, and I start talking to this guy. And he says, yes, he says, you know, I'm, you know, he's Senate Intelligence Committee. He says, but this has never been brought to my attention. And... I said, well, yes, that's why I'm meeting with you. I think I need someone like you to head up, bringing it to the attention and holding a hearing. And he just, and his chief of staff was there, literally dropped, he was reading the Wall Street Journal, dropped the paper in his lap. And the senator said, I, I don't think I really can do that, but have you talked to, so in other words, he, <laughs> you know, Kissinger called this the hottest potato in the cosmos. So this issue. And so basically, I want to pass it to someone else. So he gave me the name of someone else. So the passing of the buck on this is legendary. And I've met face to face with people who are on these committees and at the Pentagon and you know, asking them to do something about it, um, which would entail enormous risk on their part. I mean, you know, as one congressman said, yeah, I'd be known as Congressman Moonbeam. 
or, you know, in other words, the, 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 the press would have a field day. And, and I think that that's one of the real problems. And therefore, uh, should we exhort these leaders to do the right thing? Yes, of course, and we continue to. Do I think that that's a likely way it'll happen? No. The most likely way is more and more uh, people from the inside with evidence and corroboration coming forward and thousands of CE5 contact teams reaching a critical mass where uh, then an undeniable event happens that can no longer be contained, that goes viral. Um, uh, now, I don't think that it's, don't take, I don't want anyone to take away from this that I, that I don't support trying to hold our leaders' feet to the fire. And that's why I put this briefing together for the president. That's why I went to Australia and met with 120 leaders from around the world and the Minister of Defense of Australia and everything else. I still think that there's a responsibility if you believe in representative government to ask your representatives to do the right thing. Um, but I'm just saying from a realistic point of view, the likelihood of, of uh, change happening from those quarters. And it's a little bit like after I you know, did all this with the Clinton administration and you know, the Rockefeller family was running interference with us and hosted Bill and Hillary Clinton at the JY Ranch where I'd gone out there and had all the meeting with all these spooks, top secret people. And, um, and then, you know, there was a man who worked very closely with the Clintons who then came to our house. This is when I was still working full time as an emergency doctor in North Carolina. And he came down and had dinner with us at the table. And the, he said, well, you know, this was like a month or two after uh, my wife and I had come up here to meet with the CIA director and his wife. And I, he said, you know, the president and the people around him are very supportive of what you're recommending. I said, oh, good. And, you know, we're having dinner around the table in this house, a big Tudor house, and the four kids or little kids back then around the table. And he says, but um, they really don't think the president can do anything about this because they're concerned he'll end up like Jack Kennedy. And I started laughing because I thought he was, he's sort of a big, fat, you know, operative for the Democratic Party. He was sort of a, jokester and very funny guy. I thought he was just making sort of, you know, a facetious. And he stopped me. He said, no, we're not kidding. And I said, well, Kevin, don't talk about this in front of the kids. Let's talk about this later. So we went to the library later and talked about it. He says, no, absolutely. They think that this could actually happen, that it would be too dangerous for the president. And I said, well, what do you want me to do about it? I'm just a country doctor here in North Carolina rattling around in an ER. And they said, well, well they, they, they think you should do it. Yeah. And my eyes roll back in my head. Are you kidding me with this? Now, then you imagine, I'm in my 30s. And so this is 1994. So, you know, 20 years ago, I was in my late 30s. And so I thought, well, I said, then I said, well, well here's the real reason, is that it is risky, but you view the president as an expendable but I am. He says, that's right, you're expendable. <laughs> Very cynical. Very Washington. Yeah, I'm throw you under the bus, who cares? You know. So I sort of, I, since then, I sort of accepted, well, I'm the throwaway guy. You know, my career, my life, none of that matters. Because, you know, in this city, you know, it's everyone's ambition. And, uh, you know, at the Rockefeller Ranch, I know for a fact that um, when they were going through the briefing materials, uh, that we put together, which we've made available to the public. The disclosure book has most of that in it. Um, but that basically, at that point, uh, Hillary stood up and said, this is too dangerous and we really can't deal with this. So, um, and, and so what you find is that they, they are interested. Now, you know, years later, very, very close friends of, the, of, the, of the, uh, the Clintons who used to live in the private quarters of the White House, I was meeting at her home, and, <laughs> and she told me this h hilarious story that even though all the people around Bill Clinton, including his wife, didn't want, did not want him to deal with this issue because of the risks involved, um, he kept the briefing document on the back of his toilet in the private quarters 
And would, but one day he brought it out and was sitting with this friend of the Clintons that I knew very well and had it open. He was going through the document going, well, I know all this is true, but they won't tell me a thing, not a goddamn thing. <laughs> just like that. And when she told me this story, I just cracked up. I went, oh my God. I mean, you, you know. But, you know, that's, hey, everyone puts their pants on one leg at a time. And uh, no one walks on water. I, you know, I think it's, you know, it's understandable. And, uh, but to answer your question, <laughs> uh, we continue to do what you're talking about, but at, at authentic levels. I don't want to say anything disparaging about anyone, but at authentic levels because we have you know, the access to those sort of folks. But where I think the action is, is grassroots. I think it's the, the action with disclosures with the people. Uh, more people coming forward who are whistleblowers. I think the, the, it's with CE5 teams reaching a critical mass, a morphogenic field around the planet that then brings this to the next level. And uh, with the energy, the same thing. The technology is the same thing. Um, and in a way, perhaps that's how it should be. If you look at human history, no big, really quantum leap or big leap forward in human history has ever come out of the centers of power. Ever. It's always come from something in left field, something unexpected, bottom up. It's never come from the centers of power because power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So the people who are in those systems, by definition, are trapped in the mechanism of their own de their devices, you see. And so in a sense, we're more liberated. I'll never forget in 1992, the former head of Army Intelligence pulled me aside at a meeting and uh, after we were in Florida and we were doing the CE5 work and there were 40 people on the beach and that's when you've seen the video, the, the guy goes, holy damn hot shit, and there were four of these ET. <laughs> okay, you've all seen that. It was a very bad camera and there were no, we didn't have night scopes back then, but they were really quite close. You can't tell it from the camera. And that made its way over to the CIA and to this, this guy who had been the head of Army Intelligence who was doing covert stuff as a private contractor. And he was a general. And um, his, one of their best friends, and, and there was an NSA guy there also, National Security Agency guy, and they were really concerned about what we were doing, very unhappy. Um, because he basically said, you have no business doing this. I said, well, I'm going to do it anyway. Um, that's how I am, you know. I'm nice until I'm not nice, and I'm probably going to run you over. But anyway, uh, and I just said, look, you know, I'm not doing this as a civilian, and I haven't signed a security oath to anyone, but my conscience and God and, my, and the humanity, so buzz off. It's none of your business. Um, but what was interesting, one of their friends who was at this conference came, pulled me aside later, and I, wanna, I want you to think about this and, and take it into your own soul, and said, you know, they, they act like they're angry at you, but they're actually really jealous. And I said, what do you mean jealous? And as the head of Army Intelligence, this is NSA, they, they, they said, yes, but she said, this was a, a countess from your a member of royal family. And she said, you're free to do anything you want. And you can do these wonderful things. They are not free. They are in a system where they know that they are on a leash and they are controlled and they are in a black box. And they really are jealous of you. So don't give this kind of power more than you should to these entities. You guys, all of us, have such freedom because we're not part of that corrupt system. That's the power we have because we're not part of a corrupt system either economically or politically or institutionally that restrains what we want to do, which is make contact, disclose the information, bring out these technologies. So we have this freedom to operate that people who are in the system at the Pentagon and the agency and the White House and Congress really find they don't have. So it's a beautiful thought that, you know, thank God we've, I've, and I, I've been offered to be pulled into that system and turned it down. Um, because I, I, and I will not sign a security oath, by the way. All these meetings I've had, CIA director, head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, members of the Senate, head of intelligence, joint staff, J2, they've all been without me signing anything regarding secrecy. Or, and if someone says we want you to, I will not go. 
I said, no, I'm head of the disclosure project. <laughs> <laughs> Get it? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. 